Today is going to be um, wandering around a bit. It's a bit of potpourri. Uh, so we're going to really cover probably at least two completely unrelated topics. Uh, we'll see how far we get into the second one. Um, so let's talk about the apocalypse that we have actually been living through. No, not, not that one. No, actually not that one either. Just this one from 10 years ago. As, uh, as someone mentioned in uh, uh, you know, February of 2022, we would like to limit ourselves to one horseman at a time, but you know, we, we can't. So anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about the uh, era we've been living in as computer architects for the last decade, rather than worrying about geopolitics and you know, global pandemics. A uh, different sort of apocalypse entirely. Okay, um, and the other thing that's nice about looking at uh, works that were attempting to be prophetic, now that we are living in the future relative to what they were talking about, uh, we can see how much of what they thought the future would bring uh, actually turned out the way that they that they said it was. So the premise is going to be sound. Uh, the conclusions, well, we'll see whether or not uh, they were right. So the title of this is, Is Dark Silicon Useful? So we've, we've, we've seen some of this before, but we'll, of course, I'll change the focus. Oh, and also uh, stop me if, uh, I only got one bar of battery on the, on the microphone. So stop me if uh, you suddenly can't hear me in the back and I'll go put a new battery in. Okay. So uh, we're gonna talk about basically four ways that uh, about 10 years ago, we envisioned that the architecture community would react to some underlying problems uh, that we have alluded to and shown the roots of, but not examined in detail in this class. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what is the, the dark silicon uh, challenge uh, overall? Um, how and when did we actually come to internalize that this was something we were gonna have to face and uh, what we we're gonna do about it? So, this talk comes from 2012, uh, and it's going to start by talking about 2002. So ISCA is the International Symposium on Computer Architecture. It is arguably the foremost forum for discussing work in computer architecture. And if you had attended it, uh, you know, 20 ish years ago, right? There was a session, and you can see uh, some 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 commonality in the in the naming of these. Uh, these three papers are all in that session. The optimum pipeline depth, the optimum logic depth per pipeline stage, is basically the very same thing, and increasing the pipe processor pipeline depth. Uh, so if you were doing architecture research in 2002, uh, pretty much everyone, uh, some of these uh, are a little outliers even at the time, uh, thought that, uh, look, we already know how to do this, right? We know how to make good architectures. We're going to increase the clock frequency. We're going to uh, increase the, the pipeline stages deeper and deeper. Uh, we're going to push it until we actually can <laughs> technologically hit uh, the, the optimal uh, point on this. And, you know, look, everyone's going to be very, very happy. All right. Um, however, fast forward two years later, and uh, it, it turned out that that actually wasn't a terribly good idea. Now, um, in particular, uh, that you, you could actually go and find. Uh, you know, videos of people cooking things on their processors. Uh, this is in part because they hadn't uh, put thermal diodes to have the processors turn off when they overheated yet because it was a, a sort of emerging uh, thermal density problem. Uh, so you could, you know, uh, get them to do stupid things and cook themselves. But yeah, um, things were getting toasty, right? So as I mentioned uh, repeatedly, uh, Intel and the other companies are not interested in being in the refrigerator business, so uh, they consider this to be kind of a problem. Uh, also very interesting, if uh, you happen to, for some reason, be interested in low power computing, uh, low power computing before the early 2000s used to be kind of niche, right? Um, it, it's worth remembering that Intel used to have an ARM line that they licensed and could do ARM designs in. They sold it off because they didn't think it was going to be useful. Who knows? Smartphones. Didn't see that one coming. Anyway, um, so yeah, low power mobile devices were, were thought as sort of a niche, you know, low margin thing. And, you know, the big players weren't, weren't interested in such things. But once your chips, you know, now double as, you know, uh, pick your favorite metaphor, you know, hot plate, crock pot, cat warmer, 
right? Uh, you, you suddenly, uh, now everyone has a newfound zeal for low power computing, right? Everyone's a low power, uh, low power architect now. Okay. And uh, there, there's a famous graph. Now, uh, I, I want you to understand that the points with diamonds are actual measured real points. And the points that do not have diamonds are taking an exponential and projecting it indefinitely into the future. At no point in time was the thermal density of your processor equivalent to the surface of the sun. This never happened. I say this because I have seen people non-ironically talk about how we now have to deal with rocket nozzles and nuclear. Uh, no, 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 no. That, that, these didn't happen. Remember, all exponential curves in reality are one part of a sigmoid. Physics, physics doesn't really do exponential curves. Okay, so um, if you took this trend curve and indefinitely extended it, clearly it would be very bad, right? So we didn't do that, right? But power was doubling every four years. Now, there, there, there are a number of, of, of tricky things to, to read into this that are, uh, that, that are hidden by, by what's actually being plotted. So some of this is about the design complexity. Uh, note that these chips here are also uh, doing a lot more, right? So th these aren't sort of equivalent value, right? So you are getting something for your increase in power. These are also bigger chips, right? But anyway, clearly it's an unsustainable trend, whatever way you look at it, right? Uh, so people refer to this as the rocket nozzle graph. Now, the assumption, if again you're looking at you know turn of the century, uh, was that uh, where we had gone wrong was in how we were designing the internals of our of our machine, right? Because you know this is an outlier, and you know this was kind of an outlier. And if you look at this curve, it wasn't it wasn't quite as bad. I mean, it's still going up, but you know, look at the slope on that; it'd be, it'd be nicer. Um, and so, if you actually look at where pe people were going, right, the planned series of extensions for the P4, that entire lineage of its microarchitectural design, uh, they kind of jumped all the way back to the Pentium Pro and uh, Pentium 3 style uh, 12 stage uh, from their mobile design, uh, then went to multi-core, right, and said, okay, great. So we, we have erred in our ways, we're going to return to the roots of back when we made much more efficient leaner architectures, and we're going to stamp out more of them, and life is going to be great. Right? So by 65 nanometer, we can give you four of these. We're going to double this every year. Right? It's, it's, it's going to be fine. Um, that didn't actually happen either. So you did get an increase in the number of cores, but it wasn't at 2x per generation. Uh, and, the, and the frequency did go up, but it was it was going as slowly. That was more or less what was expected. So, why didn't we get uh, what they were you know going to say was going to save us from all these problems? Why didn't going back to simpler times and focusing on efficiency fix everything? Well, this is important, right? You can have an inefficient design. The Pentium Four was many things. It had reasonable performance, but it was an inefficient design. Right? It paid a lot in power for that performance. Um, but this, this is a lot more important than this, right? Basically, physics. Physics was the problem, not our designs. Uh, so let's start with a little bit of definition, right? So uh, we think apocalypse, and you, you probably think of, you know, either the book of revelations or you know, an X-Men movie that really wasn't that good, right? Uh, you know, take your pick. Uh, but if you're looking at the actual root of the, uh, the word itself, it's about the disclosure, something hidden, right? So it's an unveiling, um, which again makes, makes sense for its use by John of Patmos. Uh, so if you want to talk about what the, the Dark Silicon Apocalypse was, it was the architecture community um, and sort of everyone downstream from the architects, 
figuring out what the heck we were going to be doing uh, now that the things that we had been doing and thought were going to let us glide forward for the next n years turned out to not actually work as intended. Right? Now, when you, when you look at, you know, it's a hidden majority and misconception uh, that sort of plays in here and that the, the root of this turns out to be something that uh, if you had thought about it carefully, you could potentially have figured out in 1974 uh, except that you'd had to predict a bunch of other things that uh, everyone at the time predicted otherwise. So, okay. So let's talk about where this whole problem really comes from. And, and you've seen some of these slides before, so I won't, uh, uh, especially as it says, I said something going to jump around today, uh, several things. Um, what we're seeing is, is the following. If I have, and there's some caveats here that aren't on the slide, if I have a fixed unit area, and then I look at shrinking my transistors, then uh, in the current scaling regime, the fraction of, the, of that chip that can switch at full frequency drops exponentially due to power constraints. All right. So basically, if my transistor count per unit area is increasing exponentially, uh, my fraction of utilization is going to actually drop exponentially because I'm not actually going to be able to support that without this rising exponentially. Okay. So we've gone over scaling before. Again, Gordon Moore is still happy. Actually, I think he recently passed away. So maybe not still happy, but happy at the time. All right. So scaling factor, S about one root uh, square root of two. All right. You scale up, go from 180 to 90. So two times 2, 4x, 4x, All right? Moore's law works as intended. And this is the 1974 paper I was referencing, design of ion implanted MOSFETs with very small dimensions, which talked about how they expected CMOS scaling to work, All right? So let's all try to remember. All right. there's a transistor. And we're going to pretend the fourth terminal doesn't exist because we're in CMOS land and not doing anything particularly interesting with it. And it's just tied to, uh, bulk is tied to, tied to source, All right? So the, the relevant properties of this, as you shrink it and make it smaller, right, um, are that uh, it, it's going to be faster to switch, right? That's sort of a natural property of how the uh, shrinking the channel is going to work. Um, Logically speaking, you can, you know, you're going to shrink the oxide, right? All these sort of features are going to shrink together. And what that will turn out to mean is that the voltages that this will operate successfully at and be a fast switch like device can also change as you shrink it, right? Um, TLDR, right? Smaller oxide, smaller device, smaller voltage still switches fast, right? Um, now, this is where we're going to get into some caveats, but we'll get there in a second. Okay. So you're going to have more transistors per unit area. Those transistors are faster. But if uh, that was all that was happening, power would go whoop, and that would be bad. So the good news is uh, switching each of these individual transistors, right? There's capacitance of charging up the gate. It's a smaller gate, it's lower capacitance. That sort of pays for itself. So the speed and the capacitance changes. Uh, basically balance out. And now what about the more transistors? Well, we're going to scale VDD to pay that off, right? Uh, scaling VDD, i.e. the supply voltage that we're running these at. So if you go back and look at, you know, old computing designs and you see three volt and five volt, and, and, and if you go and open up a machine today, you're at like 0 0.7 volt, right? Again, it depends on which part of the, part of the system you're looking at. Um, but the voltage curve did scale down. But to scale down your supply voltage, you also need to scale down your threshold voltage. And that's where the asterisk comes in. So even in 1974, in his original paper, he says, yeah, well, the way that we're going to make the transistor still be fast as we drop the supply voltage is we're going to drop the switching threshold voltage. Those are going to drop in tandem. So as long as the ratio between VDD and VTH is about is roughly constant, the transistor is fast, right? Rule of thumb. 
Are we going to go into the actual you know, physics of Boltzmann distributions? No. We're going to say about 3x is good, and it makes a nice fast transistor. Right. Okay. Um, if you want to learn more, go, go take an EE class uh, looking at you know, uh, uh, how, to, how to jump over that band gap. Okay, so asterisk in 1974 is, oh, well, every time I drop the threshold, uh, my leakage is going to rise. In fact, the relationship between threshold and leakage is exponential. So it sort of makes sense. My threshold is what keeps my transistor from switching. The lower and lower I put that threshold, the more that it just kind of is a little bit on, right? Relative to, right? it's on and off states get closer and closer together. Right? Uh, but it's 1974, transistors are large and you know, dropping threshold still is a pretty high threshold and you know, the ion I off ratio, i.e. how good a switch is it and having two discernible states, is still very, very, very good. And here's the important thing. In 1974, no one thought that in 2005, they would still be using the same technology, right? So no one was worried about an exponential on something they thought was initially very small and wouldn't run very far into the future, right? Just like all of your adjustable rate mortgages, right? Okay, so, so this is a bit of a shortfall, right? Uh, and this is basically where um, the gap between the initial sort of, oh, this is going to be our new way forward, and this is what we actually built comes from, All right? So you can see this if you plot out various experimental pieces of data, if you want to sort of run the same design at filling up uh, for some fixed unit area, for some fixed particular power budget, and you scale that design across different, uh, uh, different implementation technologies, you'll see a curve that looks pretty much like you would expect, right? Fraction of that that you can actually switch at full frequency in that power budget, the case. Um, you can look at this uh, industrially, right? So all the uh, boost clocks that you see advertised for your processor, that, that's a dark silicon feature, right? So if your boost clock is five gigahertz, that means you had a design that can hit five gigahertz. There's nothing about that design that doesn't hit five gigahertz except for its thermal properties, right? So you're underutilizing it, right? Now, there are a lot of different ways that you can underutilize something. And uh, that's sort of what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about in sort of the four ways forward. There was a lot of work at this time looking at and sort of projecting, uh, well, A, but sort of explaining what was happening to the architecture community. Uh, again, think about the five stages of grief, right? We had been dependent on all of this scaling for, well, 30 years, and we didn't want to give it up and didn't want to admit that Denard might actually be dead. And so we were doing our best, you know, Norman Bates routine, still talking to, you know, to Mama in the, in the chair, even though, well, you know, Mama wasn't talking back anymore. Uh, and, you know, it took us a little while to really internalize this. But by about this point in time, by the, around 2010, 2011, we went, yeah, this, this is kind of what had happened, right? So while there was a lot of disagreement about what we should do about it, the one thing everyone could agree on was we would have to do things a little bit differently. Okay, So uh, let's talk about Mike's idea. This is a, a slide from, uh, from Michael Taylor, uh, then at UC San Diego, currently at the University of Washington, uh, and actually one of my uh, dissertation advisors. Uh, his idea on the, on the four horsemen of the dark silicon apocalypse. So there are, and I think uh, I, I agree broadly with his, his first order categorization, uh, four major you know, ways forward uh, from, from where we were going. Certainly, this is a, a good set of predictions if all you had to work with was the data you had in 2010, 2011. And uh, I also agree with this following statement at the end of this, right? Uh, none of the options that we have uh, is clearly monotonically better than all of the others in a way where you aren't going to sort of pick and choose pieces of all of these approaches. Okay. So let's start with the simplest one, the incredible shrinking horseman, right? So if I cannot fully utilize uh, all of this silicon, maybe I just don't, you know, build as big a design. I mean, I'm paying for it. Right, so why would I pay for something that uh, isn't giving isn't giving me value? 
right? Now that statement happens to be true, but whether or not it's going to necessarily lead to smaller chips is a little more, a little more challenging. So uh, partly the reason it's challenging is that just because uh, silicon is not fully utilizable all the time uh, doesn't mean it's useless, right? You don't throw away your new processor because it can't run it at its boost clock all the time. You just accept that you're going to get, you know, something less than a, you know, flying cars and uh, bunnies and rainbows future, right? Um, we've also actually for a very long time had large portions of our chip that are not at least in that sort of raw sense of transistor switching is work done, uh, used much at all, right? Our L3 mostly sits there doing nothing other than remembering what is in the L3. And that's fine because we'd rather have it remember the L3, the contents than have to go all the way up to memory and get it. Even if the vast majority of the time, we're not asking it for anything that it is in fact remembering, right? Your L3, has many megabytes of data of which in any given cycle, you might be accessing, I don't know, a few hundred bytes, All right? So it is mostly idle. There's a lot of portions of your chip that are very intentionally mostly idle. In fact, even if you look back at that experimental data, even that sort of baseline uh, value was sitting there at, you know, 5% uh, duty cycle would, you know, take your entire three watt power budget, right? So a lot of stuff on the chip doesn't switch all the time and that's not bad. Right? We have lots of things that are used some of the time. They still add value. Okay. Uh, the other reason to not shrink indefinitely is that um, the, the, the formula for where your costs go uh, is, is a little more complicated than just I spend transistors. Right? Packaging is kind of important. It turns out that if you make your chip smaller and smaller and smaller, it's hard to have the necessary number of pins, right? There, there are some other physical constraints that will uh, prevent you from sort of just doing this indefinitely and scaling your dark silicon away. Um, you're going to want to have certain sizes of chip. You're going to want to be able to compete in particular markets where, you know, even if your marginal value of adding silicon has reduced, beating your opponents still matters, right? So if I am trying to just make, you know, the cheapest possible chip, that will power this laser pointer projector clicker, uh, then yeah, I'm probably gonna shrink that thing down or uh, to the point where packaging and other sort of non-design concerns uh, begin to dominate and I'm gonna stop. Uh, but if I am building you know, a high performance computer, no, no, I'm not gonna shrink it, right? Because my value proposition is very different. Right. Okay, so there's our first horseman, round to scale. Go to the next one. Um, so again, silicon, uh, if it's not fully utilized, doesn't have to be dark. It can be dim, right? So we can build designs that exceed the, their, their simultaneous capacity, whether you want to think about it in terms of power or think in terms of thermals, uh, those are, those are different design points because the time constants are very different. Um, but that you can use all of them somewhat or some of them entirely or, 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 right? So different forms of scaling. So uh, spatial dimming is basically where you ramp up the number of cores and then you look back at the physics of transistors and say, well, the point that we run transistors at from a voltage perspective is a performance oriented point, not the energy per operation optimal point. And it's certainly not the lowest power point I could be uh, operating that transistor at. Uh, so there's a whole uh, field uh, called near threshold computing. So it turns out that even if your voltage uh, VDD to, uh, to VTH ratio is um, very small, right, I can still eventually turn things on and off right, with, with very small amounts of energy. It's just very slow. Right? It'll turn out to be very, very, very slow. Um, so there's a lot of work there on ultra low power devices where right, I can actually do a lot of things in parallel at very good energy per, per op, but they're individually quite slow. If my problem lends itself to this, this might still be a good value proposition, right? Very large numbers of very efficient, but very, very, very slow cores, right? And 
as we've mentioned with boost clocks, yes, this is 2012, so it's Turbo's 2.0, now we're up on three, I think. I think it stopped at three. Um, temporal dimming is, is definitely a thing. Uh, very, very short version here. Um, the thermal capacitance of your chip means that changes in temperature take milliseconds to tens of milliseconds to uh, be large enough to care about, right? Um, it takes a while to actually heat up, you know, your, you know, very specially, uh, um, wow, words falling completely out of my head, uh, your, 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 your uh, minor impurities, uh, you know, laden glass, basically, right? I mean, it's basically silicon, uh, some oxides, very special impurities, right? All the rest of it is that. So um, you can play lots of games with temporarily exceeding your uh, thermal design point and then pay it off by just running slower and cooling down. So you can literally think about it as sprinting, right? In fact, the, the paper on that uh, that uh, originally pushed some of this was called computational sprinting, right? So you can run full tilt and then walk it off for the next you know, 10 minutes because you're you know, bent over with pains in your, in your sides and then go back to running again when, when it's worthwhile. All right, uh, your phones actually do this all the time. Uh, this is actually enormously important in your phones. So if you look at the total peak power draw from your phone, you've got, you know, say, uh, four core, big little style architecture, right? Then you've got four out of order cores, you run those all at once, and you will be, um, if you were to do that for, for very long at all, uh, operating at a temperature where your passively cooled phone should not be in your pocket, right? But that's okay, because then it's going to switch off those out-of-order cores, switch over to the in-order cores, and then run low and slow for a while and coast in thermal management mode on your phone. All, right, so all sorts of stuff does this. Uh, the, this draws on sort of a long history of uh, things like race to sleep, Right, where you pay off the sort of passive cost of keeping the system on at all by doing a burst of work and then shutting down completely, waiting for something else to come in, wake you up, do some more work. Right. Uh, so temporal dimming, very much a, a reality in, in pretty much everything that you're buying. You have a tiny horseman, a dim horseman, specialized horseman, right? cyborg, robot, ninja, monkey, pirate horseman. Right. Right. Just gonna put as many adjectives on it as we can. Um, so one of the other things that we can look at is while microarchitecture wasn't the problem, uh, we do know that enormous gains in efficiency can be had if I don't try to build a fully general purpose computer, right? So again, the video decoder on your phone can happily decode video streaming from YouTube for a very long time compared to trying to do that same task on any of the processes on the phone. Uh, you're getting efficiency ratios there of like 500 to one, right? So even if it's a, uh, it's not something that's gonna fix a physics problem that continues to grow with any one thing that you specialize, uh, you could imagine specializing more and more as a function of time as your response to uh, other reductions in the ability to make marginal gains, right? So the short, short version is if power is the first thing you run out of instead of area, again, for much of the history of computing, area was one of the first things we ran out of. I mean, again, we couldn't fit an entire processor on a chip until the 80s, right? So the microprocessor revolution really changed things when I only needed one chip to be a processor instead of a collection of things physically wired together on some PCB or, or whatnot, right? And that didn't have room for cache, then it had room for cache, and room for multiple levels of cache and multiple cores and then, right? So integration is still important. So if we're running out of power first, then spend area over power, right? Build something that I cannot use all the time because that's the cost of specialization. You're sort of pushing back against make the common case fast because anything you specialize is no longer your common case. Right? But if I have common cases collectively that will increase as a function of the number of things I specialized for, right? then I can grow along with this. Now, the downside is if you're trying to radically grow the number of things you're specializing for, 
right? Rather than having someone spend, you know, many, many years coming up with the best way to solve this particular problem, and you get this, you know, sleek, hyper-optimized, you know, sixth generation fighter style accelerator, you're probably more likely to get Inspector Gadget than, uh, right, than some sort of Omnimech, right? So uh, you're gonna need some sort of automated approach. This was one, not ECSD, so lots of uh, internal propaganda. So we'll skip over, over the particular details, but you can, uh, it turns out, automate a lot of energy savings, even if you have no idea how to automate for performance. Automating hardware to specialize for performance is hard, given an arbitrary pile of software, but uh, squeezing energy out of it turns out to actually be fairly scalable. Now, one of the interesting things to look here uh, is if you took a design and you sort of kept the initial memory system and you just specialized the computation it's doing, right, I can make the overhead of actually doing the operation very small. Right? So think back to actually where all of your energy went. I had to get the instruction I needed to do. Right? I needed to actually figure out that I was in fact doing the right instruction and what it wanted me to do, get the particular operands it's, it's, it's asking for, and then wander through some pipeline with forwarding, with you know, dependence checking, with all of the other things that are there. And there's a lot of work that isn't just, I want to add two numbers together, right? The adding two numbers together is dirt cheap. All the rest of this is figuring out, I wanted to add two numbers together, getting the two numbers, making sure that adding those two numbers is okay to do, putting them back in the right place when I'm done, right? A lot of overhead, even on a pretty lean machine, right? Now, Think Omdahl's law, even if I did this, uh, this is going to still eventually kill me, right? Uh, the traditional memory system uh, is, is where you're getting, you know, only an 11x here instead of 100 or 1,000, right? Okay, but you can build lots of these. You can specialize for some particular workload. Great. Okay, again, we'll skip the propaganda because, well, it was 2012 and some of these things didn't actually happen. Okay, so we have a credible shrinking horseman. So cute. Everyone wants a pony. Uh, we have a collection of fairly dim horsemen, and then we elected them to office. Uh, we have Inspector Gadget over here. And then what's the last of our horsemen? The Deus Ex Machina horseman, or not actually a horse. All right. Um, so one of the ways to, to sort of look at, if you're not familiar, uh, people, people want to know the origin of, of where this. Uh, actually comes from, people are familiar with ancient Greek plays. So when gods appeared from the Greek pantheon in ancient Greek plays, they were mechanically lifted onto stage because, you know, they were supposed to be more than human. So, you know, the machine, anyway. So um, the fundamental problem that we are dealing with is really one of transistor scaling. So what if we don't use MOSFETs? Um, and we've certainly done a bunch of one-offs, right? We, we went from planar transistors to, to FinFETs. We went from, you know, uh, you know silicon oxide to high-K, you know, uh, oxides. We, uh, we looked at nanotubes, we looked at 3D stacking. All these things are nice one-offs, but they don't really scale, right? The, the fundamental problem is this. All right, there is a limit to how good a switch, a field effect transistor can be, All right? So uh, I'm gonna have this leakage challenge with my I on, I off ratio, uh, pretty much no matter what I do, as long as this is the type of device that I'm using, as long as the device I'm using uses this sort of physics, All right? So there are, um, and indeed, in the last 10 years, there have been even more uh, you know, proposals for things that don't have this problem, right? So um, you know, here, let me just give an example of something where it is fairly obvious that it uses different physics. This is a nanoelectromechanical relay. The way that it works is it uses a voltage potential to pull the gate into physical contact to have current go across it, and then basically restorative spring forces, you just pop back into its original place when the gate is off. You'll note that there's an air gap when the gate is off. It's mechanical, it moves. It is not subject to the 60 millivolt per decade uh, Boltzmann, uh, Boltzmann equation, 
Uh, when this thing is off, it's really, really, really off, right? It is physically disconnected, right? Leakage is not a problem if you're using nanoelectromechanical relays, right? You have many, many, many other problems, which is why we have not decided to build everything in the world out of, out of NEMS, but just as an example of some other, you know, uh, non-CMOS uh, non device, right? This at least should be obvious without understanding quantum physics. Whereas if you want to understand why tunnel FETs are also a beyond CMOS device, actually, yes, you do have to understand quantum physics. So I'm not going to go uh, too much into the in details of this, but it uses a different mechanism uh, for, for switching. So this is tunneling effects versus uh, the, the, the uh, Wilson probability curve. Now, I'm going to tell you some good news and bad news about tunnel FETs, because this is from 10 years ago. So good news is we did build a bunch of tunnel FETs. Various people across the world did lots of research. They built tunnel FETs. And yes, they can be, in terms of the steepness of slope, better switches than MOSFETs. Unfortunately, it turns out they cannot at the same time be better switches and fast. So a tunnel FET can either be fast or a better switch, but not both. Um, oh, well. Uh, but they were actually a fairly mature technology. There's actually a lot of work done uh, uh, by some folks uh, in, in EE here at Penn State on bringing some of these up. Uh, Intel actually did a lot of work to actually look at building these. Um, you, could, you could build an entirely different model. It could be a, you don't have to be a carbon chauvinist, but you could, uh, could just decide that, uh, right, just do something entirely different. Right, so if you want to look at a, an example of something that seems to do lots of useful work uh, without a lot of energy, brains are always fun to study. Right, so 100 trillion synapses at 20 watts, you know, operating speed of you know, dozens to a couple hundred hertz. Right, mostly dark. Uh, the duty cycle on people's brains is actually quite low. The vast majority of the time, most of your neurons are not firing. If most of your neurons are firing, that's called a seizure. Uh, you know, seek medical attention, right? Um, you know, that's uh, it's a very different design encoding. Um, so how much of this microarchitecture, how much is actually structural, uh, different, different, different physics, there's some adiabatic stuff going on with the ion transfers. Um, just to sort of pop back here, th th there are actually a lot of things that people have looked at uh, for other styles of potential computing devices. Uh, so, uh, this, this phrase of beyond CMOS is, is still very much an, an active term, uh, even, you know, 10 years on. Uh, what we have found so far and why this is still something that even if the way that we ended up actually pursuing these didn't turn out quite as predicted, you know, 10 years back, um, we haven't solved the problem yet, right? We have not found something that is monotonically better than CMOS. Uh, and CMOS is a really, really mature technology. If you look at all the work that you know, we're doing to go from you know, TSMC-5 to TSMC-3 and so forth, it's still CMOS. Right? CMOS works really well, even with all of its problems. And all of the things that we've found that at least potentially could do, could do better have other problems. So how many people have ever heard of ferroelectric FETs? Any people have heard of ferroelectrics? Do people know what the root ferro means? Okay. So, anyway, uh, ferroelectric FETs are, are one of the sort of uh, current contenders for things that might someday replace CMOS. Um, they have some interesting properties. When I get uh, really confused for a bit, you can go uh, read about their negative capacitance effects. It actually makes sense in context, right? But, um, they they, uh, they they don't solve the problem entirely either. They they have some good high drive strength, but they uh, they're actually kind of hard to turn on. So uh, lots of emerging technology stuff still going here. Uh, you know, people looking at resistive computing rather than transistors, etc. So, at any rate, long story short, um, and if we look back, some of all of this has happened. Not in the priority or to the degree, right? Everything that we buy today is an SOC, but the number of things that we decided we needed to specialize did not 
turn out to grow uh, in concert with the uh, degree of transistors made available. We did find other things to spend the transistors on, right? More cash, more GPUs, et cetera. A lot of low-end devices did shrink to some degree. This is enormously key to all of the industrial uh, things that we're, we're selling today, right? And this, we're still working on it, right? We're still waiting for someone to come in and save us from, you know, ourselves. Um, so, but active areas of research and funding, if you're into that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, let's now switch gears completely and entirely. So before we move on, any questions about the dark silicon apocalypse before I do a very, very, very short uh, review of some uh, key features of storage architectures, uh, mostly because, you know, the, uh, well, but mostly because the, the luminaries of, uh, of computer architecture also happen to invent RAID, so you have to at least mention storage architectures. If you're teaching a computer architecture class, or else Patterson cries somewhere in the Bay Area on top of his piles of money. Okay, so any questions about dark silicon before we go forward? All right, basically, physics is not your friend. We can't fully utilize that growth curve that, that Moore's law was still giving us, even with all the teething problems we've been having as we get closer and closer to the end of, uh, of, of nominal 2D Moore's law. Integration's still there, but um, power, primacy, every, everyone's a low power architect now because leakage. And uh, there are a bunch of different ways forward, but we don't actually entirely enjoy any of them. They all give us less than what we were hoping for. But we're still making better processors year after year, right? It's just a little harder now, uh, which actually was part of the, uh, the Turing Award acceptance speech for Patterson and Hennessy was that it's the golden age of computer architecture now because doing what we used to do doesn't work. So it's a great time for new ideas about things we weren't trying to do before or that we had tried to do at some time in the past and they had not had good marginal payoffs relative to turning the crank. So let's go look at them again. Okay, storage architectures. Um, if you took 331 with me, some of these slides are gonna be familiar, but we are gonna jump out into some uh, slides on SSDs uh, in a little more detail. Okay, so major parts of a computer, five classic parts, better memory hierarchy actually has more stuff out in the secondary memory system. Yes, there's still spinning disks of metal coated with magnetic uh, components, and there are solid state drives, you know, such as that that are out there. Now, if we think about the way that these things play out and why architectures care about them a little bit, but also why they're sort of at the periphery of, of architecture, if your focus on architecture is here, if you are a computer architect, you want as much of your workload as possible to be spending its entire life here in the one to 10 nanosecond range of getting data where you can actually have an, a meaningful impact on being clever and then you know changing the efficiency of using that data. Sometimes you're gonna to have to go to main memory, you know, and if that happens, then you feel you were insufficiently clever. If you leave main memory and go into the rest of the system, then as an architect, you basically feel you've lost because there is very little that you can do about you know the speed of light through copper, you know, wandering off to some other physical part of the system several inches away. Right. Right. Um, now, if you recall why people uh, in the sort of lead up to GPUs were, were super concerned about things like bandwidth, uh, these numbers should also give you some sense of uh, why, uh, at least if you're an architect, again, if you're a database person, you spend your whole life out here, right? If it's small enough to fit in here, it's not worth having a database, right? So uh, different, different views on the system for different parts of the abstraction stack. But, you know, it's an architecture class. So we'll talk about it from this perspective. If you remember the, uh, the lead up for stream processing, here you're looking at, you know, terabytes per second. Here you're looking at tens of gigabytes per channel out to main memory. And here you're looking at, you know, four gigabytes per second per lane, basically. All right, so that same sort of property that we were seeing before, where you had people super concerned about the difference in bandwidth between register and cache and the L2 cache, right? You talk to them and they're like, this is death, <laughs> right? So that's why architect and the storage architectures live sort of at the periphery of these things. But uh, we do want to actually just understand the rest of our system. If you have no storage system, you, you probably don't have a computer that does much of what you want it to do, right? Uh, because uh, in particular, 
uh, you want somewhere to have your data like not evaporate on you, right? It's useful for your data to actually be put somewhere and stay there, right? Uh, and magnetic disks are still uh, where a lot of it is because they are cheap, right? Right, rotating structure, not the, not the best way to do business, uh, to have moving parts. Uh, you got read-write heads on both sides of this physical metal, metal platter. And, you know, just to look at the organization of, of what you're actually thinking about, uh, you have a controller, you have a cache. That cache can be actually quite large uh, these days. If you buy a high-end uh, spinning disk, it's actually packed with a very, very small SSD and a bunch of DRAM and SRAM. Uh, more on that in a second. At least in terms of logical terminology, a cylinder is the same uh, track and sector across uh, a, 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 all of these platters. You have multiple heads. Uh, the, the more expensive your disk is, the more of these read-write heads you actually probably have, the more platters you have. Right, lots of density scaling. It can be pretty much anything, and it's slow. Right, rotating a piece of metal so that it is under a moving, you know, solenoid-controlled arm is milliseconds. Right, due to locality of reference, uh, if you lay things out properly, it's usually not quite that bad. Um, hard drives are actually not completely terrible on sequential read if your data is laid out properly, because then you're just spinning and not moving this this slow-moving arm. Uh, at stupidly close to the actual platter distances uh, in order to actually get, get the uh, read-write latencies uh, that you want and the densities. Um, yeah, again, I'm not going to go over this in a great deal because uh, whatever the specifics are, uh, A, we're going to go and look at SSDs instead in just a second, uh, and B, the takeaway from all this is they're really slow, right? If you've gone all the way out to disk, you know, you're, everything is going on that we were talking about an out of order execution, all these other sorts of things, multi-threading will not save you. Nothing will save you. It is going to be, you know, think about how long at five gigahertz is 10 milliseconds. Just ponder that for a bit. Find enough work to do to cover this 10 millisecond wait time. The answer is like, go load a different program, right? You're, you're, you're toast, right? There's nothing you can do uh, with, with the, now, the one thing I do want to have you keep in mind, um, so if you look at the price per gigabyte, say 2008, uh, about you know, 30 cents a gigabyte, 2019, you know, less than three cents per gigabyte. So part of the reason that these magnetic spinning ancient slow disks are still around is again, really, really cheap. This number keeps dropping, right? Okay. But what most of you think of as storage, or if you want to make me cry inside memory, um, is flash, right? If you want to really make me cry inside, talk about how your phone has 64 gigabytes of memory, right? And then it's like, no, that's, that's not what that means. So uh, flash is, you know, right, the first thing that really sort of made a dent in, in disks throughout lots and lots of different technologies that wandered around. And, you know, uh, you're like great, it's it's going to scale with semiconductor technologies, so it's going to it's going to ride a, a semiconductor curve. Life's going to be great. It's going to just you know make all the disks go away, and you know good news from 2008 to 2019, uh, it did get you know 10x cheaper per per bit, but as we just showed, so did the hard drive. So the relative cost didn't change, which is why hard drives are still around. They're both you know getting more and more and more and more bits per dollar, uh, and flash. Uh, is also much, 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 much faster, right? So here's some 2019 numbers. Um, and these numbers, again, have, have, have gone up. But Flash can be designed uh, in an SSD in a way that is limited not by the media, but by the PCIe connection if you want it to, right? If I'm willing to spend the money internally organizing my uh, NAND Flash-based SSD, I can saturate PCIe links, which again are still, you know, four gigs per second per, per lane rather than say 40, uh, like with memory, memory channels. But uh, as IO devices go, it, it's pretty good. And the latencies of doing this are microseconds, not milliseconds. So you do actually have to start thinking about how you want to use these, if not from a deep in the pipeline perspective, at least in a, um, hardware to system software to use a device perspective, right? You're starting to get down into the, into the range where things that you decide to do at the low level will actually make changes in how efficiently you're using this. 
Uh, in particular, if you go back to say the 2008 version, uh, we use them like hard drives and that wasn't actually a very smart way to do it because they're not hard drives. I don't want to spend 20 microseconds optimizing my five nanosecond, five microsecond lookup. Whereas in my hard drive, spending 20 microseconds in software to optimize my 10 millisecond lookup to make it 10 instead of 13 milliseconds was a good win, right? But uh, spending more time in software than actually spent fetching the thing, not, not so good. We, we got better at that. So there was progress. <clears throat> so let's pop over and crack open uh, an SSD uh, for which uh, we will switch here to sharing, send a check. Nope. Um, let's have to share that. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly run through these. Uh, these are courtesy of uh, SNU. Um, put it in full screen mode. So compared to your traditional hard disk, instead what you have is a collection of flash chips. Um, so you're not having a one single enormous chip, right? You actually have lots and lots and lots of internally banked and otherwise organized uh, flash chips, you actually also have spares uh, because uh, it'll turn out that these wear out, right? The error rate in flash is actually fairly high and you have to spend a fair bit of time dealing with it. Uh, when we look at how flash actually works, that will sort of make sense. So uh, good news, no mechanical latency, right? If you can get to the particular data you're looking for, right? It's just all electrical. Bad news, um, hard drives, I can read and write in place, right? I have a bit, it has a magnetic representation. I repolarize it bit set, bit unset. Flash, not so much. Um, flash works on hot electron injection and it's, it's kind of a one-way street uh, and it requires an enormous amount of time and energy to erase. And the granularity at which we do that with the circuits that give us the density we want mean we erase big chunks of data at a time, right? So we're doing out of place update. So if I have a value and I store it a one and I wanna you know, add one to it and store a two, I'm gonna write the two somewhere else. And then within direction say, your value you're looking for is now over there and mark the previous version as invalid, right? And repeat this uh, until eventually I garbage collect all these invalid things, erase that block, move on, right? So the key things that you wanna think about in terms of flash device, has three fundamentally different operations. Programming, that is changing the value of an you know, um, uh, initially uh, you know, all-in-one state uh, page of, of data. This is not per individual bit. This is a collective update. So there's a fixed granularity you do programming at, but it's kind of slow. Reading, now again, this is, uh, this, 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 these values have improved as a function of time. Uh, ones to tens, right? Again, this is technology specific. Um, the higher the density that you want in terms of number of bits per cell, the longer the reading takes. If you're willing to spend more and only be storing one bit per cell, this can get you know, down by like a factor of you know, five, you know, a couple microseconds. Uh, but erase, yeah. Erase is slow, right? Really, really, really slow. So this is a fundamentally asymmetric device. Write is super expensive. Read is comparatively very, very cheap. And actually getting rid of data is, you know, uh, like you visited some hoarder's house. It just is not done unless you absolutely have to. All right. Now we're gonna skip over that again. Uh, okay. Uh, no, I don't want that one. I want this one. So floating gate, All right? So flash. Um, again, this is 2D flash, not too much loss of generality. We now have 3D NAND flash, similar ideas, still electron injection. Uh, but basically rather than just having a transistor with one gate, you have a transistor with uh, a gate in the middle of your insulator, right? a, a thing that can accumulate a bunch of charge. You can build it in a CMOS compatible uh, in terms of the, the process steps. But if you look at the voltage, yeah, 
These voltages are not your 0 0.7 volt uh, activations. Um, reading is a more modest voltage, right? To get the data off of it, I don't need enormously high voltages and currents. To push things across an oxide into the floating gate requires a lot of effort. To pull things off of the floating gate requires even more. Right? So your program and erase are actually at these very, very high voltages, right? So it's, yeah, there we go, right? So you can easily get situations where what you need is, you know, 12 to 20 volts to be actually sort of pulling things on and off the machine, uh, of, of, of these gates, okay? So this also gives you some sense of why flash might have some wear out problems, right? So reading, I apply a modest voltage. I basically see whether or not, right? I uh, am getting a different response based on whether or not this floating gate has charge on it or not, right? That voltage is small enough that it will not cause any meaningful number of electrons to actually move between the gate and the substrate, right? So, Reading's not too bad, but getting them across the oxide, uh, the way that flash will eventually break down is the oxide will break down, All right? So if you have a dielectric, you keep putting enormous voltages across it, eventually it's no longer an insulator, All right? It will eventually burn out. And with every successive uh, denser version of flash, uh, the number of times that I can have these program erase cycles has decreased. Right, so you're at least with any sort of reliability, you're now looking at something where if I were to program a, a device 100,000 times, I would not trust any of the bits I subsequently got off of it. Uh, this is even more the case when you're looking at multi-level cells where I'm trying to differentiate between different amounts of charge that I have put on this floating gate to have multiple bits stored per cell. Um, so flash, uh, can very easily have sufficient dynamic range uh, to represent two or uh, three bits uh, per cell, right? Um, but again, right, it's gonna wear out. Can't do it indefinitely. So I worry a lot about a lot of things with flash in terms of write, uh, <clears throat> uh, write amplification, wear leveling. And if we go to let's get this, uh, let's get to that, let's get to that, let's get to that. Yes, yes, you can talk about that place update. Yes, they have better, they have better illustrations. Um, okay, um, it'll actually fade even if you just leave it uh, alone for, it, for itself. Uh, it's temperature dependent. No, sorry, I wanna go skip to the other deck. Uh, yeah, oh, okay, just here. So what we do to manage all of this uh, in an SSD underneath the hood, uh, is there something called a flash translation layer or FTL? It's not stands for faster than light, stands for the flash translation layer. And if you dig into the flash translation layer, uh, while the implementation details are a bit different, it's gonna look a lot like a virtual memory management system because basically its whole job is to remap things. It will remap things for wear leveling so that every one of these individual physical devices is written and erased a reasonably similar number of times, right? So when I choose to do my out of place update, which of these do I do it to? Well, I do that as a function of how often all of them have been written to. I wanna keep that reasonably constant, even if I'm writing the same logical data repeatedly, right? If it's your high score file and you keep getting a higher, higher number you're writing out to that disk, right? Uh, that's gonna keep moving around and that's going to get distributed across all the places you could write. So the wear leveling uh, will, will save you. Um, as things wear out, these are actually going to be over-provisioned. So you buy an SSD. The SSD tells you it's got 200 gigs of, uh, of capacity. Uh, to get 200 gigs of capacity, you probably have 240 gigs of actual flash because uh, otherwise it will not last as long as it's supposed to. Um, now, the one thing you might also know is there are a lot of individual flash chips here stupidly high potential parallelism depending on how this interconnect is actually structured, right? So flash chips get lots and lots of performance, not just from being an electrical device that you can, well, read stuff out of. Again, let's talk about the read, let's talk about the happy part of flash, reading, not writing or racing. Um, but you bank, you bank this enormously, uh, you pipeline the messages, right? The, and you can actually get a whole lot of internal uh, bandwidth within an SSD. Uh, 
the flash translation layer itself is actually uh, run by one to four ARM processors or, or equivalent usually. So actually your SSD actually has, your SSD is actually a multiprocessor. Um, they're kind of dumb and they usually don't actually talk to each other, just manage different partitions of the, of the flash array. Um, but there is a, a, a lot of current effort on looking at near data computing that leverages the fact that you've already got some processors here on this side of your PCIe bus and a lot of bandwidth here among all these chips. If you've laid your data out so that all the things you're looking for aren't on, you know, the same one chip. Right, so your mileage may vary. Uh, so even though you think of this as an electrical device and you might think, oh, it's like a random access memory, it still isn't, uh, which is why if you look at analyses of uh, flash performance benchmarks for, for SSDs, uh, you'll see that sequential uh, reading and write speeds are very, very different than random IO. Right. Um, but all of them are order of magnitude better than hard drives. And the, the current devices really can, if you want to spend the money, uh, maximize <coughs> your, uh, your bandwidth between the SSD uh, and the... Uh, and the rest of the system. Uh, so again, briefly. More slides in here I want to grab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let's talk about a little bit about how this is viewed by the rest of the system. Right, so again, your system doesn't actually understand the internals of the flash drive at all. Right, so not just the fact that the ISA doesn't understand I.O., it, it doesn't. But even your operating system doesn't actually understand the internals of your, of your flash drive. Uh, and this is a, a different um, means of management than uh, really used to be there for hard drives. Hard drives your operating system actually had a pretty good idea of the layout of your data on that disk. That was mostly its job to interact with the file system, to lay things out in some way that was, you know, performance viable and had lots of optimizations that were oriented around that. The flash translation layer fundamentally hides the internal layout uh, of everything that's happening inside the, flat, the SSD from the operating system. The operating system can't see past the FTL. So the operating system has a view of the logical layout of the data and then the FTL does whatever it wants internally to, to, to manage that. Uh, so there have been proposals, for instance, to um, if you had a you know, storage specific uh, sort of platform to smoosh together some of the virtualization support in your virtual memory management and the FTL, if you, you know, don't wanna sort of do some, some duplication uh, between the VM, the file system and the FTL in terms of these levels of indirection, uh, make it a little, a little closer, to, closer to metal. Um, <clears throat> But all right, your CPU is going to make some sort of logical uh, request. It's going to go into some queue. That queue is going to be actually operated on by a processor. Um, now, if you think about different types of properties that you might want from a storage device, we did say that non-volatility was kind of important. So if I have a processor that is managing a bunch of requests internally, that processor is not non-volatile. Uh, so in enterprise-style SSDs, you actually do often have uh, some, some battery-backed features. Uh, to enable it to dump its current volatile state into uh, some dedicated uh, flash storage just for the management system itself. Uh, because again, since flash has write endurance problems, all of my indirection tables that are changing repeatedly uh, are, are at least most of the time not in flash, they're in some local DRAM. Right? So there are some, uh, some fun things to think about if you want to think about crash consistency. Uh, if you don't, you may want to imagine a system that never fails right, then, uh, you know, uh, then the right thing to think about is basically that there are these series of requests, they get processed in some order. So ordering is a little bit of a challenge here. Do not think that the order in which you sent requests to your SSD will be the order that they're actually returned, right? It's not how the device works. Again, indirection is your friend and also your enemy if you want to actually understand what happened, right? These get turned into uh, blocks that actually are the right size of access. Uh, these get laid out logically. These get remapped into actual physical locations they are, and then dispatched across these channels, across the different planes of the die. And you can sort of look at different uh, levels of parallelism of access 
which will influence the relationship between data layout and the way that you can actually get uh, lots of data on and off the chip. Okay, let's pop all the way back to great. Okay, so Flash, fun technology, has some limitations. We build SSDs with them. SSDs are internally complicated, but uh, we spent a lot of time making them at least to the first order look like uh, they were still the old block devices that we'd uh, you know use all of our hard drives for. Okay, and again, as I said, you know Patterson invented RAID. So I'm going to talk about RAID. If you're in three thirty one, you've seen this. If if not, uh, I'm going to do the short short version of this. Um, redundancy is and fault tolerance are important if you want to build a system that works in the real world rather than just in simulation, right? Real world computer components fail, right? Your bits in DRAM flip, right? Some of your adders don't work 100% of the time. Uh, thermal sensitivity means stuff happens, right? Your non-volatile data isn't. Right. Uh, yeah, don't put your SSD, you know, next to your oven. Uh, it will uh, change the lifetime of retention. Right. And by oven, I mean your 4090. Okay. Um, so one of the ways that you can get around the fact that we are dealing with physical systems that could actually fail is you can use some redundancy. Right. This is the important thing to take away. So real systems that we care about where fault tolerance is important. Um, whether they be in the small or you know globally distributed systems, uh, use redundancy as one of the ways that the system still, in some sense, works. Okay, and for a long time, this has been done in storage because hard drives with physical moving parts definitely failed for the entire existence of hard drives, right? Uh, just as SSDs also continue to fail today. So I can build a logical uh, structure for my data. Uh, at cost of redundancy, I'm going to have to have some redundant storage, right? There's, there's something I'm going to pay uh, to, to get something that's more useful to me than these fallible devices, right? Uh, and in particular, if you think about the same thing playing out at scale, think back to the HPC lecture a while back. Um, if I have 100,000 machines, each of which with their own SSD, definitely one of my SSDs is failing basically all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, things you might care about are not just reliability, but also availability. Right, so on the one hand, you know, it, it's good that you didn't lose your data, but if I can't access my machine um, when, when, when a failure occurs, that's, that's uh, not so great. Uh, if it takes me forever to repair it, even if I technically haven't lost it, that's still not hopefully what I want, so I can optimize these a little bit independently. Um, RAID is not a single idea. RAID is sort of a collection of different ways of using redundancy. Uh, I'm gonna skip over uh, everything but the, but the last couple. Right, uh, not that they aren't uh, ever used, but uh, they're not the ones that you're, you're seeing too much of today. So uh, RAID 5, distributed parity, uh, block interlead level is uh, sort of the sort of most common thing that you could just go out and buy, uh, plug two, uh, two or three or however many, uh, well, you want one of those three, you want odd numbers. Uh, plug three you know, drives into your, into your motherboard. Your motherboard will just do this for you today if you're you know, buying anything uh, other than the economy version. Uh, not clear that you want to, but uh, you certainly could. And it's going to use basically error correcting uh, codes using XOR. And it's going to look kind of like this. So I'm going to have some number of devices, right? They are block devices. So these are entire blocks of data. And every one of them is going to be defined in terms of a, a parity block, right? So that parity block is going to be enough to fix one of these other blocks going bad, right? So if I have one, two, and three and parity, I can get four. If I have one, two, and three and four, I can get parity and, and so forth, right? So there's some redundant storage. It's a fraction of the total storage. It would require active reconstruction in the event that I get some error in reading three. I have to read one, two, four, and parity to figure out what was missing, right? So. Uh, there is some hits to, it's not, you know, just going to blindly uh, you know, burn on through when there are errors. Uh, RAID 5 has the parity bits distributed. No single uh, uh, device has all of the parity on it. 
uh, again, since you have to do this for the for the various lookups uh, and and uh, and for the writes, uh, having a single parity disk as in RAID four turned out to be a bottleneck. So it distributed. Great. Let's RAID six. More parity. Right. So RAID six is just RAID five. But what if I want to have more than one of my drives fail at a time and the system not fall over? Um, so in particular, the challenge that you have with RAID five. If one of these fails, uh, I can then rebuild it. Now, say this drive here fails. I lost P0, 8, 12, and 16. I swap it out. I shove a new drive in. It will rebuild P0, 8, 12, and 16. But during that rebuilding period, I have no protections. If I continue to use my system during rebuilding and another drive fails, all that it is gone. Right? Uh, with RAID 6, if this fails, while it's rebuilding, uh, by having an, a higher degree of redundancy, even if something else fails while rebuilding, right? I can I haven't lost my data yet, right? So, uh, short version. So this is a short version. If I want something failure resistant, and disks are definitely going to fail, right? Whether through wear out or through mechanical uh, mechanical aging, right? I'm going to want to play redundancy as my means of being failure tolerant. Now. Uh, the principles of RAID work best when these failures are independent. Uh, they usually aren't, right? If the reason that your disks are failing is that they're all on fire, probably your entire data center is just on fire, right? Well, it happens. Sometimes you build a data center in California. Um, or the more common case, I bought all of the disks at the same time. They are all equally old. So my failure probability uh, is not independent, <laughs> right? They're all gonna reach uh, end of life at about the same time, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, there, this notion of fault tolerant for RAID is not gonna give you say crash consistency if you're looking at database land, right? Uh, things can still be in uh, ill-defined intermediate states if the type of failure is not uh, a disk failure. Right, so if the type of failure is that the power went out in the middle of doing some operation, uh, hopefully your structure has metadata and logging to understand that that happened. Otherwise, the disks will say, I didn't fail. I just have weird corrupted data. Congratulations, right? So uh, this doesn't solve all of the types of failure problems you might want. Uh, redundancy alone is, is not everything you need, but redundancy is something you do need if you wanna tolerate failures and real machines do fail. Okay. Uh, I will be putting out a uh, practice exam uh, tonight. Uh, the TA will be going over it on Friday tomorrow. So um, today's material will not feature heavily. Uh, there might be a couple of multiple choice questions. That's about all she wrote. Uh, but the multiprocessors of various stripes, including GPUs, which are multiprocessors, uh, are all definitely, definitely in scope. Okay. I will catch you all in the later on.